let me be honest. We we recorded Born to Land Hard live, right? And where there was a <laughs> cut, we would go back and then do it again live. You know, I think we did three days. Wow. Whole thing? I, yeah, I believe so. Oh. <laughs> 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 Hello, welcome. It's Hardlore time. How are you, Bo? I'm lovely. <laughs> uh, me too, considering I think we're in for a historic Hardlore episode. Mm. Um, this is one that when you when you hear the word Hardlore, <laughs> I would say the first band that probably comes to mind is Cold as Life. Yeah. Considering there's no harder lore in existence than the, the, the lore... Made by this, our, our guest here, Mr. Jeff Gonnels. How are you, sir? I'm well, bro. Well, I'm blessed to be alive. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the, the invite, man. Oh, absolutely. Of course. I wanted to start this off um, on behalf of the goatee community. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I wanted to thank you for you know, your loyal servitude throughout these several decades. Hey, hey, th thank you. It, thank you. It's a, it's a bit tame these days, but... Uh, hey, uh, you're blazing I, the trail, nonetheless. I, I've, I've always rocked them. I, I hope that mine is, is, is snow white and as gorgeous as yours down hey, the line. Right but I'm doing that. my best here. I, I feel like you're like you're like Captain America, man, to me. You know? Oh, bro. You were, you were frozen in time for a while. I was. I was. And, and now you've come out to find the world you've built mm. completely different. What are your thoughts on kind of where hardcore is now versus where you left? Yeah. Well, I look at the Detroit hardcore community now, as opposed to when I was out before prison, uh, it was violent. It was small. You had to have your, your head on a swivel, um, be clicked up. But now it's like this healthy, uh, vibrant young crowd that, uh, that uplifts each other, that invests into that community and culture. And uh, one thing I noticed right away is that, uh, is that, and that uh, just the difference and and what it was and what it is right now. Does that make you happy? It does. It does because there was a lot of years where uh, you really had to fight, to, like literally fight, to have a good show and have a good time. Because there was all these pecker woods, all these, you know what I mean? There was just all these fucking different factions that would come and there'd be fist fights and stabbings and there'd be ears on ice waiting for paramedics. And wow. it was, it was a ridiculous place to see a show, but now you don't have to do that. You don't have to have your head on a swivel mm. You can go and you know what I mean? Hang out with your friends and have a good time. At tied down, um, beast from hate Inc. We were all talking in the back and, and we told him we were going to the casino and he was like, what do you mean you're going to the casino? You need a you need a firearm. You need to borrow something. Like, can I help you? And it's just funny that like that, that's still there based on what you guys all had to go through just to fucking go see some uh, some live hardcore music or play a show. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, this myth. Or, well, there is a, a bit of a revitalization in the city of Detroit um, where there's a lot safer areas than what it used to be. But it's mm -hmm. in pockets. You know, mm -hmm. in little slivers of the city where it's safe and, you know what I mean, trendy and, you know, it's it's that whole gentrification thing where, you know what I mean, the rich people came, kicked the, the poor people out and, and they made it nice, made it their own. But there's definitely some places in the city you don't, you don't want to be in. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Casino is apparently one. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a few different, there's a few different casinos. What's the one we went to? MGM. We went to uh, MGM. Yeah. Okay. All right. Which, well, you know. I mean, it's not horrible over there, but you definitely right. have to, you know what I mean? The ghost your... of Chris Cornell is haunting. Yeah, we got, so that's, we got robbed that's in a very thing. different way. Right. Speaking right. of speaking of ghosts, Jeff, I, before we get into the lore of Jeff and Cold's life, um, at Tied Down, I got to ask you about this. All On right. your way out, I don't know if you <laughs> knew in the moment that you were like a secret comedic genius in this moment. <laughs> 
Um, you you leaving Ty down in the back. Do you, I don't know if you remember this moment. I think I do. We were uh, we were hanging out back, and there was that blood moon. <laughs> but but I do remember us hanging out, and I, it was just time for me to go. But but yeah. that's what I remember about it. I don't Dude. know about the comedic uh, part. <laughs> the timing was unreal. You went, man. That moon looks beautiful. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> that became the, like, a, a, the saying of the rest of the right? weekend was like, Jeff's going to turn into a werewolf. He's got to get out of here. Well, that was going to be my punchline, bro. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the punchline wasn't even necessary. Yeah, yeah. You killed right. it. I got right. it. Well, well, hey, man, uh, those those little things in life I've learned to really appreciate because, you know what I mean? I Like I said, I was I, I was gone for the lion's share of a decade and uh, mm. night sky, sunrises, you know what I mean? Be free, fresh air, free man, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just the things you don't realize you take for granted every day. But yeah, those little things in life aren't so little. Those seemingly insignificant moments are not insignificant or little. Wow. Fucking unbelievable. <laughs> I guess while while we're on pr in prison, while we're in here in this mode, yeah, yeah. Um, you're you're a riffer, man. You are like a born, learned, tried and true songwriter. How how difficult was that to not be able to write music for that long? Well, so uh, to be honest, when I was in prison, uh, I had such a sour taste in my mouth about some of the things that had happened with my camp. Mm. Um, mm. I was disgusted with a, a lot of music. So they there were on the, in the lower levels in prison. Uh, like not the max securities, but the the lower minimum security prison. There's music rooms and jam rooms oh, where you wow. can get guitars and plug in and jam. But uh, like I said, I was disgusted with the some of the things that happened in my camp, and yeah. I wanted nothing to do with it. Wow, music in general, music in general. Wow, because we're gonna we're gonna get to it. I imagine when we talk about like Ramallah and stuff okay. eventually, but. I believe I've heard tell you're responsible for one of my favorite riffs ever written. So to hear that is is crazy. But I guess, like you said, the context of which you were you put yeah, it, it down sense. for a minute, it makes total sense. Did you? But did you still like in your mind? Were you humming stuff? Were I I wrote a lot of uh, I don't want to say lyrics because they're not composed or nothing like that. But I, there was a lot of a lot of heartbreak, man. A lot mm -hmm. of hard times, and I did a lot of writing in prison. I've yet to put them you know, in a composition form, but, uh, uh, I, I plan to, I plan to put something together here in the next, uh, next year where there might be a possible new cold as life record. I mean, that's huge news. Amazing. I, and I think you, there's like charted statistical evidence of you just getting better and better at writing music. So I have to imagine with everything you've been through, you've a never had more to say. Never. And, <laughs> and B, there's been this hole in hardcore of your songs for so long that I, I'm just excited to hear your take on hardcore now. I, I think it's healthy. I think it's it's bigger than it's ever been. I think the musicianship and the composition, the lyrical content, I think all of it has come light years from what it used to be. It used to be 4-4, four, four, you know what I mean? And now yeah. people yeah. are actual musicians in the hardcore community and culture and i love seeing it how it's evolving i, I would <sighs> i would hate awesome. to see i would hate to see it like commercialized or any kind of pop culture you know what i mean uh but but i think that it is uh grown leaps and bounds mm. that's fucking awesome finding punk and hardcore in mm. 80s detroit what was that like for you in terms of just discovering the genre and then finding like-minded people to play music with? Oh man, it was, uh, you know, that gift of discovery, right? It, it, so a couple of the first shows I went to, you know, I started out listening to early Slayer, you know what I mean? Uh, I started out kind of metal and I saw the Daglo abortions at uh, this place called the the Greystone in Southwest Detroit as like mm. a 15 year old, 16 year old kid. Yeah. And, uh, I lost my shit and I knew that, uh, that there was more out there and I just started looking and looking and finding and finding. And it was, uh, I, I was hungry. I was hungry for music. I was hungry for the wow. history. 
So when you're finding and finding and looking for music, are you connecting these dots through record stores or T-shirts that people are wearing or word of mouth? Thanks all, lists. Yeah. All of it. All yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of record store back then, hide head shops, and we would just go look through vinyl all day long. And even if you heard nothing about the artist, if the cover looked cool or if it looked like the genre of, that I was looking for, I would just buy the shit. But do you think being from Detroit and with the history of like Detroit rock and roll, like, do you think that there's just a higher likelihood that you were going to find a harder version of stuff? Guitar you, music. Yeah, guitar general, music yeah. that you grew up hearing. Like, I, I love the early Detroit yeah. bands. I mean, how couldn't you? Look at yeah, MC5 mm -hmm. and Iggy Pop and, you know what I mean? There, there's count. So ice, Detroit's isolated. You know, it's not the East Coast. It's not the West Coast. It's not Atlanta. It's not Miami. Detroit is fucking isolated even from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And it had its own it had its own sound and it had its own thing. And, and I, yeah, it was great. It is great. Mm -hmm. It is great. And you are such a integral part of that own thing now. And like, that's something I wanted to talk about is another charitable growth that you can see is like a direct line between MC five and coldest life. Like you can see chronologically how just Detroit gets there. Uh, and it, it's really cool, man. It's a, it's a unique place and, you know, negative approach popping off all, all the New York hardcore bands will tell you, like, we just, we saw that and then we decided to do that. It, it's, it's a special place, man. It's a special place. Uh, negative approach was one of the very, very first influential hardcore bands that I, I mean, there was punk and then there was metal. But I think negative negative approach was one of those bands that were exactly what I was looking for. Mm. Wow, you you and 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 every and, yeah, influential yeah. New York hardcore band, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. What was what were your first bands? Uh, so we had this band called the Apathetic Degenerates. It was more of a Sick. punk band. Uh, then we had the Mattress Rats, which was. <laughs> Uh, right, right. It was it was also a punk a punk band that turned into Cold as Life. Right. Uh. Yeah, but I pretty much done Cold as Life, Hate Inc. and Ramallah. That's about my three three bands right there. Wow. wow. Good God, man. And that's and you and Cold as Life was were, were you guys touring pretty extensive? Because the Breaking the Law cassette was eighty nine. Yes, sir. And that's like it's insane some of the songs that are on that, that you're still playing to this day or that are on Born to Land Hard and Declination. Uh, so to know, to have that identity so early and, and like you, like you said, that's your band. Like that's that Ramallah and hating that they've been with you your entire life. Yes, sir. Did you guys feel that pretty early on of like, all right, this is us. This, this man is who I am and yes. uh, we're going to start hitting the road. Yeah, we didn't start like touring. We would do one offs and we would trade shows with bands from the East Coast, uh, Midwest bands, but we didn't start like touring, touring until maybe uh, late 90s. Late uh, wow. I think 99 was the first European tour called His Life Did. And then, wow. we, and then we stayed touring for pretty consistently in the States after that and maybe a little before that. Who, so the uh, first Euro tour you did after Born to Land Hard came out was the first like touring, legitimate touring you guys did? Yeah, 99 was our oh. first like legit tour in Europe anyway. We would we would do like short runs like a couple weeks at a time in the United States. But like the first, I would say, legit tour where we had agents and shit working for us yeah. was in Europe. Do you remember wow. who that was with? It was Theo from The Noise. And MAD, he worked with MAD. MAD, oh. yeah. Do you remember what who, bands? Who played, who, well, yeah, well, who did you tour with? Oh, God, some European, actually some that made my playlist that you have. Uh, Length of Time. Uh, Length of Born, Time. Born from Pain. There you go. Um, there was Classics. Do or Die. But, uh, yeah, that was a blast. Jeff made a playlist just for this episode that he curated, handpicked some songs himself. You can click it in the description for the episode wherever you're listening. Hey, I got, I got I got a funny story about our first show, right? It's our first show in Europe. First time over there, and Marauders playing. The uh, those two bands I just mentioned were playing, 
uh, a, a, a handful of great a gamer hardcore bands from the state side. And, uh, we had this, this in our band called Johnny Myers, Johnny hate for short. He's not, he's not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. And I got Johnny stories for days, but, uh, it's in my notes here. Yeah. Yeah. He was known (laughs) for, for Zanak and Jim Beam. And he, he would drink himself stupid, eat a handful of ladders. Well, this dude, we're on stage, right? There's a bunch of people on stage, first time over there. He can't even get his guitar tune. It's screeching and wailing, and he's drunk as hell, and he can't play a, nothing. He can't even tune it. So I shot over there, and I turned him all the way down. Uh, I, I look over. We're big dogs carrying the guitars. I look over, and he's looking at his amp, trying to figure it out, half in the bag. And, uh, and he notices that his volume pot's all the way down. So he looks at me, he catches me looking at him. He looks at me and he turns it like to 11. (laughs) (laughs) Screeching and wailing. So I fucking ran over there. I kicked his half stack over. I pushed him off the stage and then whipped the mic at him off the stage. And all I I remember looking around and seeing a bunch of mouths open. Like fucking cold as life. (laughs) It's funny as hell. So after the show, though, I, I shout out to the van. We were in a van. Shout out to the van. I ripped open his luggage. And there was about nine prescription bottles. There was about like three story, real tight road alley, load indoor. Yeah. So I took all those prescriptions, made a basket in my t shirt, took all his prescriptions and shot out of the van and just started throwing them in every di- direction on rooftops. And he came out and caught me doing it. The, wow. The, yeah. The next day we were in a hotel and I hear this commotion in the hallway and I open the door and he's on a stretcher. The paramedics got him. And he goes by, he's wheeling by, and he looks at me and says, hate. So he, <laughs> he, he, shot, he shot to the hospital. He shot to the hospital to get some more, like, codeine or get Xanax or wow. whatever the fuck it was he wanted. So that was first Old <laughs> Life European show. Yeah. Do you remember yes, what country? To me, that's perfect. To me, that's like, that just, that just ties it all together. I think I read... Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Was that also a show that ended early and there was an ear on the floor? No, that was a, that was a Ramallah show in Brockton. Mm. Yeah, that was, a, uh, I think, <laughs> Colin of Arabia played and Ramallah and some other uh, some Boston bands. Mm. Um, speaking of guys like Johnny Hate and Beast, Detroit is a place where I mean, you had you had Madball writing songs about how good you were in 1994, you know, about just how cool you guys were. Detroit seems like a place full of like infamous hardcore kind of characters, you know. Yeah. Um, and none seem more infamous than Ron, the 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 former singer of Cold as Life. Yeah. Well, well, Ron, uh, if he loved you, he loved you. Right, but but it could switch on a on a dime. He still loved mm. you, but you would be rolling around on the ground with him. Okay. Um, he was he was bitter. He uh, he'd been through a lot as a child. Um, there was no boundaries with the dude. He he would grab up a cop, pull him off a horse, and start pounding the teeth out. He, he if you were in his way, you were going to get dealt with. But again, I think it was just from scars. From his childhood, he was mm. very angry. But if he loved you, he loved you. But again, if you know, he was. Uh, I loved him, and yeah. I also hated him. <laughs> right? You know, he he was a uh, he was a monster, but he was a, a kind soul at the same time. It's hard to describe him because uh, you know you can hang out and drink beers and you know just chill. Yeah, and then the next minute you would you would be fighting, banging it out. So it, it's hard wow. to describe him. And it, it's interesting too because he's a a pretty prolific lyricist. No, oh yeah, like, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Finding out at you know whatever point that there even was a singer before you and called you know as I was like growing up and learning about music and stuff, finding out there was a singer before you, and that you know you chose to continue using some of his lyrics as like almost a, I don't know if you want to call it a tribute or whatever, you know, um, and, and kind of learning about this kind of mythical, um, person. And then the, the dichotomy between being, um, 
you know, kind of violent and, and a potential monster, like you said, while also ha- being so poetic and having these lyrics that are like unbelievable. Sounds like some guys I know today. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. What, what an, an interesting character. Well, so, so that potentially violent or potentially a monster, he, he was both. He was violent and he was a monster, but he was also a father and a, and a son and, you know, a friend. So yeah, there is a, there's a, um, there's an irony there for sure. But, yeah. uh, mm. but he, he, he was a fucking monster, man. And I mean, that's why he died the way he died. He died in a bed with three bullet holes about in a pattern about this big in his temple because wow there was people so deathly afraid of him. We used to tell him all the time, somebody's going to kill you, man. Somebody's going to kill you. And, uh, he, he lived his life that way. And when you live your life that way, that's what happens. Yeah. And that's just like a, an insane thing that further adds to the insanity of cold as life. Oh uh, man, there, there, there's four of our members that are, you know, under gravestones marking the places where they lay. Mm. Wow. You know, it, it, it's been a, a long, hard road for a lot of us. A lot of people want to hear this, the horror stories and, the, you know, the shit shows. But there's a lot of heartbreak in there, man. It's not, yeah. you know, all fun and games, man. There's a there's a lot of heartbreak in there. But Bo and I were talking about this just privately earlier, but like an, an HBO <laughs> scripted series about your man that was 100 percent true would sound like a fictional tale it would be a little too far-fetched right uh so ian mcfarland he's a uh he's a director Legend. and filmmaker he's a good friend of mine we were mm. talking a few months back and we were talking about possibilities of doing something uh you know there was a documentary that got started and never finished you and i had a, a quick conversation about that and i would love to see it finished just to really put this story out there you know what yeah. i mean because because there's a lot in there and there's a lot yeah. in there and you can never pack it in an hour conversation, a two hour conversation. I don't have a great memory. I smoked a lot of weed as a younger guy. Um, I don't have a great memory, but there amongst me and my, my people, the people at my table collectively, we could tell the story. You could put it together. Um, uh, I mean, I would love to help tell that story yeah, in right. some way Absolutely. at some point. Hopefully this wink, is wink. the, this is the prologue. Jeff, I, I read something. Um, it said that well, while you guys were at the services, you decided to continue being a band and to let Coldest Life like continue being a thing. Is that accurate? So we never wanted to stop. Okay. Um, you know, losing Ron uh, on one hand was a tragedy. On the other hand, uh, it was a breath of fresh air. Sure. Because any time, any time and every time that we went out or played a show, it was fucking straight chaos. Mm-hmm. Like I said, when, when I mentioned it didn't matter if you were a cop on a horse, that's a true story. Ron and I went down to the fireworks in Detroit at, at uh, Hart Plaza. And uh, he, had, he had triple mohawks, right? Leather bristle studs and acne style. Yeah. So we're walking around and all these jack boys were making comments, slick comments as we were walking by. It had been a couple months since I hung out with Ron because, like I said, every time you'd go out with him, you'd be banging it out with who, whoever, whoever he decided yeah. to start banging it out with. And I was done with him. <laughs> so all these dudes were saying slick shit to him going by and he's doing nothing. He promised me that he wouldn't. And uh, this cop on a horse with the leather jacket said yeah. something slick and he reached up and pulled this cop off a horse and started pounding his face. So like that, those aren't me- like metaphors. When I mentioned that earlier, yeah. that like that shit happened. It's real. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Damn. So it, real was, deal. it was a relief when he died, but it was also a tragedy. You know, he had a young right. daughter. Yeah. Well, I ended up um, raising since she was like three years old. Oh shit. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it was tragic for her and his ex and a lot of other people, but it was also... How, how old like is a, she now? She is, uh, God, she's, uh, I think, 31 now. Wow. Is she, is she coming to the show? 
Uh, I, I so um, the, some of the residuals of going to prison, doing what I did to go to prison, um, mm-hmm. has, has left real, really strained relations on my mm-hmm. kids and I. Sure. So I don't know. I hope that she does. I hope some someday soon that we can reconcile because that's my biggest residual, my biggest heartbreak to date is uh, not having contact with her and my other sure. kids. I mean, I hope that this they can watch this and just see, like, uh, just from our perspective, the, what a legend their dad is and mm. the, the mark you've left on on this now worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Um, more importantly, I think that they're looking at the things that I did as a father. You know what I mean? The things that I didn't do as a father. You know, I think that our, our decisions matter. And I made choices that took me out of their home. They went very from very well taken care of in a secure home, loving mom and dad, to complete uncertainty and poverty. And I had, I've had i been out of their life since 2012 because of what I did to go to prison. And right. uh, it's, that's, I think, what they're looking at more importantly than what I've contributed and t- musically to anything. Sure. Wow. That makes, I mean, totally, totally understandable. But I, I hope that there's, you know, light at the end of that tunnel and that everything can work out. Me too, bro. Thank you. Yeah. Let's get into Cold as Life here. Uh, yeah. All I right. feel like it's time. So Breaking the Law is 89. You had another demo in 92? Uh, 92 or 93. 92 or 93. Yeah. One more demo. Yeah, there's a lot. 96? Yeah. I feel, is there more than that? God, you'd have to ask Beast. Okay, he's got a better <laughs> okay. memory than I. We've we've done so many little recordings and you know demos right. and I I looked at the Wikipedia today and there was like six demos. Yeah, all named after holy you. shit. So it's hard. I, I imagine. Yeah, it's like you know you're you're doing recordings and sessions and but you're ultimately are you knowingly building up to Born to Land Hard? Not knowingly, but that's how it evolved. Yeah, yeah. Because well, some of those demo songs are on Declination, so it's oh wow. It's like a mystery to me how, I mean, obviously a, a big part of Born to Land Hard is you re-recording all the songs as the, the now vocalist of the band. Um, and it's, it's, you were like, you had the foresight to be like, okay, all these songs are really fucking good. We've had them for a while. We've been playing them for 10, 11 years now. Let's get them all on one package were labels courting you for a long time? Because yeah, you, but but you hundred percent. Did you self release this completely? Absolutely. Yeah, there, wow. we 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 wanted to be DIY for sure. We we didn't want to uh, go any label route. There was a lot of people interested in signing us, but we just didn't want to do it. I have to imagine Victory was dying to put this out. <laughs> yeah, to, to, Tony wanted us <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, Born to Land Hard. With no hyperbole is an era defining, genre defining, like universally renowned classic hardcore album. I'm not blown smoke. To me, it is perfect in every single way that a hardcore record can be. Um, the first question I have about it. <laughs> the fucking guitar feedback. Dude, the f- that was my first question too. <laughs> How did you do it? Yeah. yeah. I guess it's just them dialing them tones in. Do you remember um, what head you used? I think I had a solid state crate back then. <laughs> Holy God. shit. So yeah. many people are going to be yep. furious. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. But that, I think that's what I used. And then, uh, wow. Holy shit. I, I can't even remember who, what guitar player I was using back then. It might've been, uh, might've been Johnny, but, uh, it just, so did both. Johnny play the songs on the album? Yeah, because um, I assumed did you? you did. I, I I think it was mostly me playing them. Uh, yeah, I think it was mostly me playing them. But okay. I, Johnny definitely did some guitar work in the studio. But uh, wow, it, I mean, it's dude, been a long who, time. Who, yeah, who was the primary writer for like the riffs and and the the song structures and stuff? Me, me, I was. Jeff. All right, next next question. <laughs> you, he just answered both the questions I wanted, like in a positive, like what yeah. I wanted to hear. So a lot of the the riffs on this record, to my ear, 
are kind of, we're going to get a little bit into musical weeds, but they're kind of yeah. on an upbeat. They're kind of, you know what I mean? Was yeah, that yeah. like a rhythm? And there are bands that kind of have their rhythm. Dying Fetus has a rhythm. Mad yeah. Ball has a rhythm. You know what I mean? Was this like a rhythm, a style of writing that you just always liked? Or was it just, it just kind of happened? I think it's uh, the bands that had influenced us. You know, we were listening to a lot of uh, like English punk, like the Cops Bar and Stiff Little Fingers, GBH. <laughs> we were listening to a uh, negative approach. Um, like I said, I was a metal guy before. Yeah. So I, I think uh, I think that it just happened organically, really. Yeah. Too. And it's insane you saying that, how much it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, right. Because it's really like it's it's all those things. It is it is negative approach riffs, Cox Bar riffs played through a fucking crate by a metalhead with a with just a different <laughs> drum, like a with a, like, like a mid tempo thing yeah. happening instead of a yeah. fucking blast beat. Yeah. And it, dude, it's unreal. Like there's there's no th this record has never been replicated by anybody. Nobody can do it. Even down to like the way it sounds. The way it sounds. Specifically, is, is terrifying. How many people have tried to recreate that sound in the last 20, 15 years? You know, many have tried all, all of <laughs> your voice, Jeff. Oh, yeah. Like you're you're the second singer of the band. You took over because you had to. And then you had that fucking thing in you the whole time. <laughs> I, yeah, Where'd you find I mean, that voice? I, listen, man, I never wanted to be a singer. Honest to God, I never wanted to be a singer. I just wanted to play guitar. That's why I like playing in Hating and Ramallah so much because I didn't have to sing. I yeah. do some backups and get crazy yeah. and kick people in the face, but um, <laughs> I never wanted to be a singer. Never wanted to. The best singers are reluctant singers. Right, though, right. You know? We tried right. guys out, guy after guy after guy after guy, and none of them worked out. Nobody could get the cadence right. Nobody could. Nobody could do it. So I just said, fuck it, I'll do it. And did you know you had that tone in you, which is again I, and a, a pretty iconic, like iconic the voice on that record, I, you don't hear anywhere else. It's a no. one in a million. And you know what's funny is you know how you hear your voice on a a, a recording voicemail anything you're like yeah. oh, that's me yeah <laughs> I, every time I heard my voice on a demo on anything I, I would cringe I I never mm. I would never a fan of my voice at all <laughs> dude. <laughs> Wow. That thing, but like, so to somebody trying to get into hardcore, where they they hear the entry level bands, you know, the the safer, more simple things, when they come to me and they're like, "How do I level up?" Mm -hmm. Show me something crazy. I show them Cold as Life, really, because it has all the things they're looking for. But it's like, hey, this is real. This is actual, mm -hmm. real, scary music. So <laughs> if you want, if you want to take this journey, you got to try this. Uh, um, let me ask, um, the verse riff in little from the world, the chugging gun, 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 gun. Well, Cause that song is verse fast part verse. Yeah. And, the structure right. The totally structure's unique. strange. Like it's a, it's a very interesting song that is probably the first song that people hear from coldest life when they, it's probably the number one song I would imagine on. Spotify. Or I mean, that's a landmark hardcore yeah. song in general. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, like I said, uh, uh, a, a lot of our shit just happened organically. It was yes. there was nothing that I was looking to recreate or uh, or mimic. It was just, you know, lyrically and musically, it was just something that felt right. Wow. How how like learned are you at just music in general? Because like this record is full of key changes, tempo changes. You, I mean, you said we were talking about it earlier, like everything was 4-4. Four, four. In, in every single song on this record, there's something I've never heard a hardcore band do at that point. Hmm. It, was that intentional? Were you like, we got to change the key here so this hits harder? You just no. wrote shit you liked. We were way too re to, to, <laughs> to be that strategic. We were playing checkers, man. We were playing Fuck. chess. There was no chess playing going on. We were flying by the seat of our pants. Wow. Dude, I, I, I busted a rib the other night and laughing hurts really bad. <laughs> oh, ribs, just, it, ribs are the worst. Oh, I would have bet, Jeff, my life savings that every single thing you did on this thing was intentional mm -hmm. and that you were this 
musical mastermind, which you are, whether you deny it or not. But just knowing that it's organic is is kind of the proof to why it worked. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank thank you. I, I of mean, course, I guess. But I, yeah, man, it was. Uh, <laughs> you know, we were derelicts, man. We, we we a lot of times we didn't even know how to tune our guitars. Mm, we would just. Awesome. Uh, I mean, we'd sit on stage and ram. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you got to know. Do you know that that again that riff from Little from the World, like created a genre like a, a sub genre, genre of, of hardcore? A sub genre of hardcore no no I, I mean i've been under a rock for for quite a while but what what people would call like beat down hardcore now it's pretty much exclusively that well i, I i'm i'm flattered i'm a humble guy but i'm super flattered when i hear things like that honestly but like i said uh, you know it just happened. It was, a lot of shit was it. accidental. Um, the the title track, opening track, the record starts with this legendary feedback. In the studio, are you hearing that feedback and going, fuck, that sounds sick? I, I, I've always been a fan of feedback, like that swell feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that's always a top. Yeah, man, that's always a topic at our rehearsals. If anybody starts screeching... You know, we'll, we'll stop it right there and say, no, man, you're not going to screech like that. You got to swell, get, get, adjust your pots, you know? Wow. wow. So, See, you get it, man. Yeah, you know what yeah, you're doing. Yeah. I, well, now I do. Now I do. <laughs> when did you start playing guitar? Uh, 14 years old. Yeah. You remember, wow. you remember the first guitar you got? It was a white Yamaha my dad bought me. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Yep. Sick. Yeah. I, I would play that fucker till my fingers would bleed. <laughs> What were you What were you riffing to early on? Like, were you listening to records and playing along with them, or were you just jamming on your own? Uh, yeah, I was not talented enough to listen to a record and play along. Yeah, but I, I didn't have that ear. But uh, I mean, certain parts I could pick out. I would go to this guy and uh, that would teach me certain songs on tab. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's how I got my start going to going to lessons and and reading tab. Amazing! Fuck yeah. Um, I, that's something I've always wondered that the breakdown section of born to land hard where the big, the big build with the swelling feedback, that's just the bass playing the riff. Then the one guitar playing the riff where the feedback literally never stops to the yeah, end man. of the song. Was it written that way? Or was that a studio thing of like, this feedback sounds good. What if we just leave it through the end section? Uh, so, uh, I think we did it in a couple different tracks, right. Or a couple different mm -hmm. takes. Mm. And, uh, I think it was Johnny just sat there holding that note and that chord and feeding back. And we all kind of looked at each other and was like, yeah, man, just wow. stay doing that. <laughs> Don't <sighs> even play the part. And look, in the same song, there's the, the rest, the dent. <laughs> was that like, that was always written that way. Yeah. That was written that way. That's awesome. Heavy doesn't uh, always, or hard doesn't always equal heavy. What, yeah. what do we say? Hard and heavy are different things. Two different it's things. Completely different and things. Is, and that's hard. That is hard. Yeah. Fuck. And it's primitive. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Sequencing this record. This is something, something that is, we talk about all the time is like such a key aspect to making a perfect record. Uh, was that something done ahead of time or was that something where it was finished and then you kind of figured out the order? Well, let me be honest. We, we recorded Born to Land Hard live. Right. And where there was a <laughs> cut, we would go back and then do it again. Like, you know what I mean? But we didn't do drum tracks, then guitar or bass. We we did it in a room. There were some 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 glass isolators, but we we did it live. That's a live recording. Yep. Holy <laughs> shit. You're breaking all of the molds, you know, yeah, for like how music is made. But now. that's another piece to yeah, why it's yeah. so magical and can't ever be replicated because those guys will never be playing those songs again at the same time. So no other band can do that. So, Jeff, did you – the vocals are – are the vocals doubled 100% on the record? I, I, I believe so. I believe so. If not, like, a ton. Was that – Yeah, cool? it, was, it was a ton. Yeah. Like I said, I hated my voice, and it, I felt like I needed something, man. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah well, I, I doubled, I doubled them up. It works so well. A lot of it times does. that can sound awful, but for some reason, it's just perfect. It's like perfect. How long did it take you to record the whole record? How long did it take for you to do the vocals? Uh, well, we're talking a long time ago, but I, I want to say it was Max Tracks in, uh, I think Albany, New York. Albany, um, yeah, yep. Uh, but I think, uh, I think we did three days. Wow. 
Whole thing? I, yeah, I believe so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's magical. That dude. is that's that simply doesn't like a, a record um, that long doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, like forty five minute epic opus, dude. Come no on. Way. Um, samples. Oh, how was that done in ninety eight, ninety nine? Like physically, how are you doing that? Oh fuck. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think one of them was a sample from that Cape Fear when De Niro. Yeah, yeah I ain't no white a pa- white trash piece of shit. Good old boy guts gonna keep me down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that was De Niro and Cape Fear. Yeah, uh, I think a, a lot of the sirens and uh, police chatter was just from uh, uh, we had these uh, police scanners that we would use because we were always up to no good. Sure, and we, and we had a uh, one of those little recorders. And we were just sitting around drinking beers, and we recorded the sirens and that those that police chatter for right. uh, for terror zone. For, right. Yep. Dude, I mean, the, no one today who's using samples is using them from some kind of like practical standpoint. It's like, well, <laughs> what would sound cool? Yeah, yeah. You guys had a scanner for a practical reason. Right. And thro- <laughs> holy shit! A necessary, a necessary. <laughs> Functional police scanner turned right. into art. That's fucking badass. Um, man, the where are we going breakdown transition, I have to tell you, I think once a day in my life, <laughs> it goes through my head. Nice. Get, the, get the gag out and get in. Um, was there a song on here, for, you know, whether it's one from the demos or one written just for the record, where you finished it and you were like, we're pretty fucking good. Man. Yeah. Damn, we got something. Cold as life might make it. Like, what did you think the hit was? Uh, probably uh, all alone. Yeah. Wow. I mean that uh, hell hell of a track three. You know <laughs> that that one two three combo is unreal. Is that track yeah, three? We, uh, Fuck. We had a fun. We had a good time, man. We had a good time recording it, and uh, I'm I'm kind of uh. Like I said, flattered that it's still relevant, even that people are listening to it. Honestly, you know, I never thought that it was going to, you know, be what it is. And I, we were just hardcore kids doing our thing. We never really thought that it was going to last or, you know, be one of those records that uh, that impacted people's lives. Let me ask you a question. That's why it lasted, though. How did you... At the time, I'm sure I would imagine how you define it now is different. But at the time, how did you define what hardcore was? What made someone a hardcore kid? What- I mean, I guess uh, being one of those people willing to jump on a table and kick somebody in the face for what you believed in, what you loved, what you cared about. Um, it was definitely underground. It was uh, something that had to be protected and fought for. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was a culture that not a lot of people knew about. It was like on the fringe, like yeah. nobody knew about hardcore, or, or, you know, or not a lot of people knew about it or punk for that matter. But it was just something that, uh, it was a bunch of, uh, you know, outlaws and, you know, those people that were forgotten and unforgiven that lived hard lives that just played music. You know what I mean? It mm. was, uh, it wasn't that jack rock. It wasn't um, rap. It wasn't, it was just uh, that underground music community. And it didn't matter back then if it was punk or hardcore. It was underground. There we go. That's exactly why I asked. That, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. It's wonderful. Things things, things evolved into this clicky ass shit, right? But back then it was just underground music, man. Mm-hmm. It could be, I saw Slayer at Blondie's. It was like a 200 person room on Seven Mile in Detroit. With a wow. with a foot high stage, I saw Celtic Frost there, Boy by Creator, and it was all underground music. And the punk kids went to those shows, and the hardcore kids went to those shows, and the metalheads went to those shows. Mm. And that's what I liked about it. Yeah, that's what I I still you know it's it's a little less probably it's a little more uh, nerf balled nowadays, but it's still what I like about it. I love the the idea of whatever that is. We don't want that. We want this. Yeah. you know. It's it's mu- it's more than the, the sound of the the way the song sounds, and it's more like a co- an unwritten code of ethics yeah. among people. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, let's talk about the song "Police" for a second because <laughs> I think that's my favorite "Cold as Life" song. All right, uh, and I think that's one example of kind of like the literal depth 
of your songwriting and where everything you just described, like, yeah, I, yeah, I love Slayer and Negative Approach and Cox Bar. T to me, Police is like this completely original take on hardcore music. Mm. Like, I don't think anybody else sounded like that or sounds like that. That's an example of people that connect, that try to connect the dots and say Cold as Life is this beatdown band. That, that, like, that belittles the music to me. Because Cold as Life on this record show you every single spectrum of what hardcore and punk can be. Wow. Including the, in Police, this big fucking beastly bulging opus of a song. <laughs> Uh, with the crazy fucking panning vocals. Oh, dude, yeah. I, How does that song rank in your personal view on your own songs? So, so Ron wrote them with lyrics. Uh, so, so I, I'm pretty sure that almost every member of Cold His Life has been beaten down by cops. You know what I mean? Cuffed and yeah. you know thrown around, beat down. Um, Ron wrote those lyrics. I remember Jay Way and I writing the uh, the the music for it. But I remember writing the, the music for it and, and loving it. And I remember Ron saying, I got something for that. Fuck. And th that's how it came together. But uh, I, I love that song, too. We're playing that October 7th, but we're, we cut it down a little bit. We just cut down one verse or one lyric, uh, yeah, one verse out of it because it repeats and it's a fucking six sure. minute song. Uh, and it's a lot. It's a big boy. I, I'm a fan of that song. I yeah. like it, man. It's, it's a good uh, one. You know, it's a story. You know, a lot of the coldest life songs are, are experiences that we lived. And, uh, yeah. you know, as far as that, you mentioned coldest life being a beatdown band. We've never been a beatdown. We never wrote a song and said, we got to put a breakdown. We didn't even know what a fucking breakdown was. You know what That's I mean? Right. We just wrote the songs and they were, you know, there was just those parts. But we were, we were never like trying to pigeonhole ourselves into any kind of verse, breakdown, verse chorus you know we just wrote yeah. the way we wrote the proof of that is literally track one and two um so two more questions about borderland hard jeff you write and record and finish this 45 minute hardcore masterpiece you and the rest of the band are listening back to the masters for the first time do you know do you realize what you've done here <laughs> we we weren't real happy with it man <laughs> I'm to be honest with you, we uh, we should have done this. We should have done that, or it could this could have been better. Anything specifically that you weren't happy with? Uh, me specifically, my vocals. <sighs> but that's you know, yeah, that's uh, that's we're our own harshest critic. Yeah, but course. let me tell you, on the record, <laughs> on the stand, on trial here, <laughs> right, right, that's a it's a one of a kind vocal performance, never yet never topped by anybody. Ah, thank you, Colin. Of course. So you hear this master, you hear this timeless piece of music and you go, we fucking suck. <laughs> we we should have done this. That's unreal. I mean, that just, I hope that bands listening to that who maybe aren't loving their stuff, look at this and look at the mirror and go, okay, I'm not alone. How do you look back on it now? I, you know, I, not, not like it sucks, but, uh, I mean, it was what we were doing and it was just, uh, what we did. Are it, you surprised? It, I, yes. I am. I'm. I'm surprised, flattered, uh, shocked that it's even relevant for. You know. I mean. You know. We like I said. We were just hardcore kids, and uh, we did weren't set out to. Uh, you know, break molds or write an iconic record. I mean. Yeah. You know. But that's why it's iconic. Mm. I feel funny even saying iconic. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I'll say it for you. All right, you all right. All right. All right. Uh, last question about Born to Land Hard. Where is that baby today? Oh man, we just we just got sued like uh, Nirvana. No kidding. You did? No, no, no. Oh, okay. nah. I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, man. I, fuck, I don't know. We, I think it was just some. Uh, uh, I don't even. I don't remember where we got it, but I know yeah. you know we wanted to call it Born to Land Hard, and uh, I mean, how much harder do you, you know, than being born a crack baby? You know? No, absolutely. Perfect title, perfect album, perfect artwork. It, it it encapsulates that thing that you said when you were out looking at music in, sh in stores. You didn't give a shit what it sounded like. You never heard of it. You see an album cover, visceral and crazy looking. You're yeah. like, I'm fucking buying this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that that all makes sense because that's how I felt as a like nine, ten year old hearing this for the first time, hearing that feedback, hearing your voice, 
and just knowing like, damn, this nothing sounds like this that I've ever heard. And to this day, as a 30 plus year old man, I could listen to this every day. This is a, this is a vitamin for me. Right on. So great job. I can't wait to finally see you guys. Pardon this interruption. It is Manscaped time. Two. My favorite time. <laughs> I have been sweating in this chair all day <laughs> editing this episode for you <laughs> lovely people. And thank God my trusty crop reviver is right here mm. to keep me company. Mm-mm-mm. Anybody else would be stanking in this position, but I'm clean as a whistle. I tell you what, I use the lawnmower. I want to, hey, maybe this is a little unorthodox. I don't. I use it on my face. I use them to keep them trimmed. Wow, you That's do. You go both. I go both. No, I don't go both. <laughs> he goes. Both. I don't go both. I have two. Okay. Sometimes I have two, but <laughs> I love scaping my man. Let me tell yeah, you, yeah. I use it. I literally use it every day. I use either a body wash, the foot spray. I got the cologne. Yeah. It's all rocking. Thank God that anybody who listens to the show can get any of that with code Hardlore for 20% off plus free shipping. We, we're, we're Manscaped OGs. We're lifers, dude. Yeah, big time. Proud to <laughs> be Manscaped. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show. And uh, to, uh, we get tagged and like, just bought my Manscaped photos all yeah. the time. And we, we love you for that. And you're welcome. Cause Should we tell them about, nah, about the recent? Nah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it, it, is, it is also whatnot time. We're Boy, big fans of whatnot, <laughs> and the triumphant return is upon us. Sometime in the next one to two weeks, we will be back on whatnot. The best place to buy and sell new and used hardcore memorabilia in the world. You got trading cards. You got video game stuff. You got sports stuff. You got music. You got... All of it. Everything. It's the coolest place. Lars Fredrickson is on there. Brody King is on there. Dan Housen's on there. Hard Lore is on there, and we'll be back any minute. We're going to do a f- really cool live auction episode type thing where you can get the Hard Lore shirts that we've made in the past couple months that nobody really has. Posters. Posters. All kinds of cool of stuff, man. It's going to be awesome. It's the closest thing, as you've often said, to a live episode that no one ever gets to see again. Nobody, it's an exclusive that. event every time we do it. Yes. Also, we just wanted to plug real quick. Cold as Life is back October 7th, Detroit, Michigan. You will find the link to tickets below uh, in the description. I know they're going fast. Mm. So it's a big room, but it's filling. He told us a, today. It is it's like filling up 80% <laughs> full. So yeah. this lineup is insane. You don't want to miss it. Uh, we're going to give away two tickets. You're going to hear about how we're doing that a little bit later in this episode. So stay tuned to find out how you can win tickets for the Coldest Life Comeback Show, October 7th, Detroit, Michigan. Back to the episode. We'll, we'll get to declination in a second because that's, to me, that's the fucking, maybe the harder record. Mm. Real ones, no, declination is probably the harder single piece of music. Um, something I wanted to ask about is, you know, you guys, Madball's writing CTYC in, in 94. You guys are shouting out DMS on this one. How does that, how did that relationship between Detroit, Cold as Life, and, uh, and, and the New York hardcore guys come about? Uh, there's a city in Michigan called Flint. Uh, Agnostic Front was playing, and they invite us to open the show for them. And, uh, and we just all clicked. And so we were doing, we were swapping shows. They'd come out, we'd play with them. We'd go out, we'd play with them. Where the, the relationship really gelled and we, you know, we became brothers uh, was a uh, Madball Set It Off release at, at CB's. You guys played that? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Mm. We were banned from most places mm. just because of the shit that would happen. Mm-hmm. I was wondering about that. Oh, it was ridiculous, man. <laughs> so a uh, funny story that, that set it off uh, record, right? Yeah. There's, we went down to St. Mark's, and uh, I forget the record store, but uh, it might have been Bleak or Bob. I forget, man. There's a bunch of record stores right in there. But there's some stairways going down into this where all this vinyl is. And they had a Victim in Pain record, one of the original mm-hmm. uh, first presses. 
and Roger's there and uh, Freddie's just a kid. I'm talking squeaky voice kid. He's young, young. Mm. Um, I think stigma was there, but Ron was still alive then. Uh, so maybe it wasn't the, the set it off. When was set it? When did set it off? 94, 94 was set it off and that has the CTYC track on it. Right. Okay. So, so it had to have been a show before then because Ron was still alive. There was probably 12 of us that rented a van and shout out to New York to play this show. It might've been an AF show. But before the show, right, we uh, we go to this record store. Ron's alive. We're up with AF guys. And we go down the stairs, and my boy Dougie Toms, Carlos Toms from Detroit, he's one of those notorious hardcore cats from here. He sees that original press, that first pressing Victim in Pain, and he wants to buy it for, for Roger, right? And there's like a $150 price tag on it. And he said, well, this is the singer of that band, man. Cut me a deal. Like, you know. You know, give me a little slack and I'll buy it. So I want to give it to this guy. This guy was, you know, get fucked. I don't care who the fuck this guy is. <laughs> so fucking, uh, so Ron fucking shoots back behind the counter, grabs the fucking album off the wall, whips it, breaks it. Fuck, the guy's trying to grab the phone to call the cops. He rips the phone out of his hand, starts cracking the guy in the head. These AF guys are all looking like, what the fuck is going on? So these guys are shooting up the stairs while Ron's tearing the place up. And then we finally got out of there and then played that show that night. But that, I think that's another one of those moments that, you know what I mean? We all kind of like really click, you know, when you go through some crazy shit with somebody, it could be war, it could be prison. It could yeah. be, you know, just some kind of hard ass stretch. Mm -hmm. That's when those bonds are really made. For sure. And I, and I think that was one of those moments where those guys were like, yeah, cold as life's cool. <laughs> no, I mean, absolutely. I feel like you guys have always been looked upon as like the scariest guys in the communities thought you guys were the scariest guys in the community. <laughs> you know? So naturally, that's a, that's a natural fit. And together. it was kind of out of necessity. You know, they were from some rough places in New York. We were from rough places here. And I, I yeah. was going to ask, do you think that's where the, the kindred – yeah, absolutely. I think light calls the light, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. And then and then Madball's playing October 7th, right? Absolutely. So that's full circle poetry. Yeah, man. Yeah. Beautiful. I didn't it's even gonna realize. Be, the lineup, that lineup stacked. It's going to be a good time, man. Yeah. I wish one of your projects was doing it. I know, but we'll be there. Right on. Cool. Yeah, we'll be I'll, sing, uh, I'll sing Police with you. We'll, All right. we'll, we'll do something. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, cool. I had one more Born Land Hard question. How, as if you're self-releasing this record, yeah. what did distribution look like for a record like Good that? Question. How do you get that record to California? How do you get it to New York? Like so uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Gayton, he did a little stretch in Ramallah with me. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. he, he was a, he's a Toledo guy, and he worked for Lumberjack Records, a distributor, and he helped a lot with that. Um, and there was some uh, that Theo from the Noise he helped in Europe. Uh, it was it was just all friends, you know, just selling DIY. that record and us yeah. doing shows and selling it. But it was it was minimal distro. Wow, wow, that's that was my last question. But it was sought after. It was a mythical thing that everybody had to get their hands on, and now it's on vinyl for the first time. Absolutely, yep. A three eight nine. You can pick up a copy. I think pre orders are. There's they sh I think I mine already came, but <laughs> I I saw some people when we announced this episode saying like my record literally gets here this Thursday. This is perfect. Oh, perfect. Uh, Fuck yeah. Nice. So that's the, good. Dom A three eighty nine is getting ready to repress it too because uh, he's out of them. So woo, it's a good yeah. problem to have. Yeah, that's the best. Right, problem right. To have. So talking about declination, can we can we discuss that aspect of it yet? Absolutely. It's uh it's remixed, it's remastered, it's getting ready to pop right now. By none other. <laughs> By none other than our own Taylor Young. Yeah, man, he's done a great job, man. He did a great job in sound. So the, we were never happy with the uh, so the material we've always liked. They loved them, loved it, but uh the the production on it was horrible. Mm. Horrible. It was uh it was just garbage. So Dom sent it to your brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he worked his magic, and uh, I got a couple of uh, test presses and gave it a spun and spin, and it it sounds good, man. I'll have you know, in preparation for this, I asked Taylor if I could hear it, and as a loyal, loyal, cold as life head, he said no. 
<laughs> I'll be even more honest with you. I've had it for months. It's not, it's and, nice. <laughs> and I listen to it every day. Right. Um, and it's 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 beautiful to finally hear your vision. Mm. You know, that's what it feels like. Is like this is this is the record that was always there. I like the original version because it's raw and hard, and I love the song so much that like I could I could hear through whatever problems you had with it. Like it sounds like there's like fucking six guitar tracks at all times. It's huge and crazy. Mm. Um, but that makes the fucking the like big chug pit sections hit. Like who holds the truth? It's crazy hard because of how insane it sounds. That, um, I like the material, like I said, man. But uh, I think what your brother did with it, 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 it felt like our black eye forever. You know what I mean? Wow. But uh, what your brother did with it, I'm I'm happy with it finally. Wow. I'm 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 proud and glad to hear that and i'm ecstatic with it like i i love that he got to do that at because he and i are yeah lifelong declination believers right right cool uh, but now we're about to make some believers out of out of thousands of more people if not millions well that's more the, the thing there. too that's like perfect timing yeah is that this that the the first record's out it's available on vinyl for the first time the show's happening and then oh you like that? Yeah, the next thing just got redone, and you're gonna yeah. love it. So that, it's that's amazing. You're playing. You playing some of these songs at the at the gig? Uh, yeah, yeah. We're doing "Who Holds the Truth" and a couple <laughs> of thousand thousand yard stare and days born amongst <laughs> enemies. Woo! Yeah, a couple more, I think. We're, okay. We're 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 kind of do, we're doing a lot of oh uh, I want to say a lot a lot of born to land high. We're doing some sure. some of the stuff from the demo days, and then some of the declination. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. How did you hold off on putting, because Who Holds the Truth was a demo track. I, the demo version's awesome. How did you decide not to put that on Born to Land Hard and hold out for the next LP? Uh, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> just kind of held off, I guess. It was nothing strategic. Just what, what fit the time and the place? Yeah. Yep. Mm. I mean, yes, that's sir. a good, that's a good, that's good ammo to have in your pocket for the next album. I like that song. Oh, yeah. It's a hit, dude. Where did you record Declination? Uh, fuck, man. We, we flew out to Vegas and started. We were out there for a week, hated it, scrapped it. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't even know where it was recorded. Wow. To be honest. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I that know was, where it was remixed, baby, at the yeah, Pitt yeah, Studio yeah, yeah. in Van Nuys, California. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, do those Vegas recordings still exist anywhere? Uh, yeah, some. I think Dom's got a couple of them. Uh, wow. So, uh, yeah, Dom. Got Dom from A three eighty nine. Dom, email your boy. <laughs> uh, he he uh, he's a good. He, he's one of the best decisions I ever made. He's a good. He's a good. He's been a good guy. Yeah, the yeah, whole man, time. Solid, solid guy. He's got a great eye for everything. Great ear for everything. He's he's stand up. He's honest. Uh, he's more than fair. Generous. Yeah. Best Beautiful. decision cold as life's ever made. You know, Beautiful. we put out we put out those demo uh, years on vinyl first, and then we did the Born to Land Hard. And now right. this declination is getting ready to be done. And me and the guys that I got right now are getting probably going to write a new one and hopefully Dom's still part of it. Awesome. Oh, I, I mean, I imagine he's be, he'd be dying. To be. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I can't wait to hear what you, what you see as new cold as life. I'm so curious yeah. to what that is. I, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, with declination, was this intended to be self-released again? Cause I know that at some point wasn't stillborn in, involved. Uh, that was, Oh geez. I don't know if that was earlier or, I'm not sure if uh, Jamie was interested in that one or Born to Land Hard. I can't remember, mm. honestly. But it, it still was a was a hundred percent CTYC production, right? Yes, yes, sir. Fucking awesome. Uh, okay, the, an interesting anecdote about Declination of Independence. <laughs> There's a song called "What It Was" on there, Jeff. The song that got me into ska. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so the, I, you know, I had avoided ska my whole life. Cause it was like, I can't listen to Scott cold as life will kick my ass. <laughs> I can't disappoint. And then, uh, and then lo and behold, here's this song on there. This, this ska masterpiece. Tell me about what it was. What made you put a ska song on this record? 
so uh, Love Songs for the Unloved by Sheer Terror. Mm-hmm. Amazing my, record. We have fucking a one of one of my top three fucking records of all time. Not just hardcore wow. records, records. Period. Period. Uh, Dude, a tale of Moran, perfect song. Fuck, bro. That that <laughs> from start to finish, that record is the masterpiece. Wow. But uh, they used a lot of horns. Well, not yeah. maybe not a lot of horns, but there were some songs on there that they used horns. And uh, I was so influenced by that album that I that I just wanted to do something with some horns on it. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense now in retrospect. Yeah. The the Everything's Fine cover with the horns on the old new Bard and Blue EP, dude. Those are some fucking horns. <laughs> <Tell you what. laughs> God damn. <laughs> oh man. Oh, Taylor and I, when I was fifteen and he was nineteen, the very first band he and I started together was called Demon Seed. Really? So so thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Nice. Declination. We're, we're day one declination, guys. I'm telling you. I ain't nice, lying. nice, nice. But yeah, I'm, re- I'm really excited for people to finally hear that. Um, Me too. Shortly after declination, was that when Ramallah started? Yeah, we kind of, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on, you know, at this table. And, uh, so blood for blood and cold is life for playing a show and we were at sure. this after party me and rob and some of his boys were hanging out and rob pulled me aside and said hey brother i want you to hear something so uh so we shot off and he put this disc on and uh asked me if i wanted to play guitar with him on it and it was uh about a whimper and I, from the first note i said yeah yup, i'm in so wow. I think that was in, uh, I want to say like 2004, maybe, two, early 2000s. Yep. Yeah, yeah, 2002 is yep. about a whimper. Wow. I did that till about 2007, but uh, that was a dysfunctional band. There was, you know, habits and, you know, whatnot. Sure. But, so, but Ramallah was one of my favorites. I can't take credit for any of the writing. Rob did it all. Oh, all really? All uh, everything. Everything. Uh-huh. Wow. So that yep. that was what I was gonna ask you is, what's uh, what song is it, Colin? Is it um the is it Ramallah the song? Are you thinking of dun 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 Yeah, with the one with the one with Bannon on it. I oh, thought uh, was Al Shafa. I think okay. it's called. One of my favorite hardcore songs of all time. <laughs> like it's insane. No, no hyperbole, and I thought. I had heard that you wrote that guitar part. So that's, you cleared that up. So that's well, all Rob. Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't write a note of that. I just was it a humble, honest man. Yeah, very, very honest. Was it, um, were you excited to play guitar again? Were you like, yeah. 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 Especially with, with Rob's a musical genius, man. He, uh, yeah, he's a real musician and he, it has a way with work kind of like Paulie bear from sheer terror. Mm. There's, there's people, vocalists that, really can connect with the way they write rob lind is one of those guys he can he can explain something lyrically in a way that not many people can just like paulie bear could and he does these callbacks where he just says the thing again and you're mm-hmm. like damn how the hell did you make that work <laughs> right right yeah. uh, i the, the only time i got to see romala with you in the band I remember being so excited that you had like a cold as life merch table at the show. <laughs> so as a me, 14, 15 year old me was like, this is, un- this is the best day of my whole life. <laughs> I get, they, I get would, to see the man and get a cold as life shirt. This is unreal. They, they were mad at me for, for setting, <laughs> setting my merch up. It, it would, cold as life merch always did real well. Mm. And they yeah. would get, they would get mad because they felt like I was t- taking money out of whatever kitty mm. Ramallah table would have. But I had, sure. uh, you know, responsibilities as a father and I had to do what I had to do. And I felt bad, but I mean, what are you gonna do? When I, Jeff, when I say the words, most violent show you've ever played, does something, does one specific thing come to mind? not really there's a, there was there was a lot a lot of them most of them i mean not maybe not most of them but uh uh-huh. there was a lot of them so there's not one specific one i'll tell you that one ramala show in brockton that was that was pretty good that was pretty <laughs> violent brockton's a rough city yeah 
It is. I, I mean, COA played, so I imagine he was he was having fun. Right, right. Oh, he always has fun. I so I uh, Gian plays guitar in a band called King Nine, a friend of ours. He wanted to ask me to ask you on his behalf. Uh, from there's a live video from Magic Stick in '97 where you play a song. The title is hard to make out. It sounds like reality is is life or something like that. Reality's light. It has like blast beats in it, and or reality's fight maybe. And he's like, he wants to know where that song is and if he can ever hear it. I I don't even know what. But it is he's asking. I'll I've, send you the video. You yeah. tell me if you recognize it because right. it's a hit, dude. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard. Do, do that. Do that. Do that. And I'll let you know. You can let him know. He's a good cat. I, he's solid, dude. I love him. He'll, he'll probably he'll be there. Cool. Uh, at, at the gig, I'm sure he'll be he'll be very scary. Um, <laughs> I was also asked on behalf of uh, Will from Never Ending Game to ask for a few Johnny Hate stories. You got any more of those for me? Oh, uh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I know I'm not supposed to use the word, but I already have a few times, but uh, I'll say derelict from here out. But this dude there was you go. Uh, a derelict. Um, <laughs> he, listen, the state paid him money to stay at home. He was he got disability checks from his because of his mentality and mental sure. health issues. Um, so he would always disappear. You know, we'd have mm. shows coming up. He'd be gone. He lived with his mother. Her name was Patty. She was from like down south somewhere. And I would call her. She was like my go to when Johnny would disappear. Mm. I, I would call. He'd be gone. Patty, where's Johnny? Ah, he barricaded in his room. I, I, how long has he been there? About a week and a half. I was like, well, can I come over? She said, yeah, come get him. So I go, I go over there, right? And she wasn't kidding. The fucking door was barricaded. It just was mm. February one time. We're going somewhere, and uh, I looked at his mom and asked her, "Can can I kick the door in?" She said, "Yeah, get him." So I fucking make my way into this room, it, full dressers in front of the door and all this. It's like mid February. It's it's sub zero temps out. He's got this window air conditioning unit out full blast right in the middle of winter. You could see your breath. He's got this black light going and this. Remember the Exorcist where she's all demonic. Yeah, right. That that negative approach record. Cover. Negative yeah, approach. Yeah, cover. yeah, right. Well, he's got this black light poster with this black light and this air blasting, freezing cold, and he's standing in the middle of the room. Wow, what the fuck are you doing? He's like trying to levitate. So this motherfucker was locked in this room for who knows how long trying to fucking levitate <laughs> so, so, this, so this other so this, this other time right so he lived uh, not like a few blocks out of Detroit, maybe a mile or two outside of southwest Detroit off this main mm -hmm. thoroughfare called Fort Street outer drive or Southfield Freeway Fort Street he's like a couple streets in a couple blocks in the neighborhood disappeared he's been gone for weeks again I shoot down I, I make this left on his street and I'm looking down the street and I can see like two weeks or two, two blocks down. I could see this commotion in front of about where his house is, but I'm still too far. I can't see what's going on. So as I get closer, man, uh, I, I see this dog, right. And like a baby stroller. And it looked like this dog was attacking this baby stroller. And I, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. And I see it's Johnny with this baby stroller. And he's got this fucking dog chained to a tree. And he's ramming this dog with this baby stroller. And it looks like there's a baby in it, right? I jump out of my fucking van. And I, I what the fuck is going on? And I look. This motherfucker had cooked a turkey. Like a, <laughs> like a fucking butterball turkey. And dressed it in a fucking onesie. Like a baby onesie. And had it strapped in this stroller. And he's fucking smashing this dog with this cooked turkey in a onesie. Just to do it? No, I, I, so I jumped out. I said, "What the fuck are you doing?" He's like teaching my dog to kill kids. I, he was just fucking out there, man. <laughs> he was out there, bro. Yeah, Holy he, hell! Yeah, he was oh. out there. <laughs> Johnny Hay. Let me ask Johnny you. Hey, God. Let me ask you about the. Um, we're kind of going back now, back to Borderland Hard. Um, the picture oh. of all of the the five band members. And then all the boys in the back. 
yeah, that was those were all the, all the people at our table, you know, and our camp. Yeah, those were uh, a lot of good friends, and still some of them are. Some, you know, some of them are shell shocked and dispersed, and yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, some of them are still hanging tough. Did you have to get a pit bull to be in the photo, or could no. you be in the photo if you had a pit bull? No, my boy Bird, uh, Fred Staffordshire Terry's pit bull oh. back then, and uh, I had one. He was in the picture. He had yeah. his, and then there were some others that were that had them. The pit bulls are big I, in Detroit. They used to be anyway. Yeah, I think that's the best band promo photo ever taken. Yeah. The, the pit bull pick. I, I like the, the boys. I like the black and white ones. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I hear it is. I'll I'll have shown it multiple times <laughs> by now. All right, right. That's my favorite photograph ever taken. Every band should aspire to be that, but know that you never will. Mm. <laughs> you know. I, I have a question for you, Jeff, that is may- maybe a little, I don't know, it's like a meta, meta cold as life question, but it's, it's, do you have any opinions about, maybe not now since you're back, you're playing shows, but 10 years ago, let's say, about bands covering cold as life? I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I, it flatters me. You know what I mean? Okay. So I, I had heard stories before, and this is, and I'm saying this as somebody who, we we Harbors Way did cover Cold as Life one time. Mm-hmm. Um, where we had heard that people maybe who were friends with you guys who were around at that time or whatever went up to other bands. Well, I never never with me, but heard rumor that someone went up to someone else and was just like, Don't cover Cold as Life. Like, don't don't be doing that. You know, there was times that we would cover songs, right? Yeah. And it yeah. was it was a, a, a gesture, uh yeah. Always, you know what I mean? Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, it was somebody that was influential in our camp, and we would cover them out of out of love and respect. So I never, there was no kind of bullshit like that. Beautiful. You know? That's what I wanted to hear. That was from that was from some fucking jobber, bro. That wasn't from the <laughs> that wasn't the from man the, right man. here. I know. I'm, I just let him clear it up. Yeah, absolutely. I if I do it, if one of my things gets covered, I'll shed a fucking tear mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what I'm that's saying. That's beautiful. It is. That's like the ultimate. Honor. That's right. That's like a, that's, and also, that's, do you that's find as, good as a tattoo? You don't really find that. Like, if you go to like a pop concert, you'll hear a fucking Bob Dylan song or something. Yeah, you're not going to hear like a contemporary cover. That's sick. No. Uh, you see a lot of Cold as Life tattoos, Jeff. A ton. That's the coolest shit ever, huh? Yeah, a ton. As a matter of fact, if uh, <clears throat> if we end up doing another recording, I'm going to solicit for Cold as Life tattoos, probably for the artwork. You should. Our friend yeah. Dan has <laughs> Dan Seeley, King Nine singer. He's got Born to Land Hard right on his back there. Across yep. his whole back. Yep, I've seen it. Yeah. Love it. Um, are there are there Detroit bands you feel like never got their due or or deserve more respect from the modern audience? So uh, early on there was a, a band called Pitbull that mm-hmm. uh that that were good hard hardcore band, real good hardcore band. Craig Holloway, he played in a band called Ricochet. They were good, mm. um, but I think that the, the the standouts, I think they got their due. You know, they they, mm. they got their their names out there, and they they got theirs down. Love it. Uh, somebody wanted me to ask you about an ICP show that you played. Oh, man, <laughs> uh, so it was IP, ICP's first show ever. They were just little wow. kids, and. Uh, they had this manager. He's from Southwest Detroit. His name was Alex, and uh, it was a, it was in a seedy part of town. But uh, but they show up. And ICP's got their pants on backwards, like crisscross used to do. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, they're little kids. They're not doing the face paint yet. But wow. uh, But they they come in with this manager and start demanding the headline, and they're playing with established bands. And I think Ron yoked up their manager and told them they'll play when they play and. I mean, the show went on. It happened, but uh, yeah, it was this place called Todd's on the east side. The same you, owner that owned Blondie's ended up taking this place over and doing shows there. Oh, wow. I see. Okay, so ICP's first ever show was supporting Cold as Life. Yeah. Yep. How did wow. that? Was that a, a manager knew of you guys, or did like? I, yeah, I just know. kind of. Honestly, I don't know how that happened. You know. Yeah. I, I, wow. <laughs> since um and you know and in the, the post prison jeff g world 
Are there any bands that you've come across that you missed that you hear now that where you go, fuck yeah, this is what I'm talking about? A lot of the stuff you do, absolutely. The, the world, I love that band. Uh, there, there's a lot of new great, almost all the bands that played that tie down. I've listened to uh, a lot of Martine stuff. Uh, yeah. The King. Yeah, man. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, wow. there's a, there's a lot of great bands. Like I said earlier, the musicianship and the composition nowadays, it's never been better in the hardcore community. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just look forward to be so but like, you guys know I've been gone for a long time. And I used to run around like this. I liked what I liked. I had blinders on and I stayed with what I liked. Sure. But I like being introduced to new bands now. I'll give it a listen, like a real listen. And uh yeah, I'm excited about the direction that, that this this genre is going. Man, that's like beautiful to hear, because just as I've said a million times, like the 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 stamp you've left on it musically ha- is only going to make things better because the, the like the, you're impressed by the composition of music today. That's because the composition on Born to Land Hard was so damn good mm. that they have something to go off of now. You had nothing to go off of, right? Mm. Right? Hey, you so, just did that. <laughs> I don't know about that. Man. <laughs> But I'll tell you, one of the, my favorite records right now is that N Rain, that new N Rain record, Dom's mm-hmm. band, and oh. Mike score on vocals. It's fucking yeah. sick. Super group. Yeah, man. Yep. Super group. Yeah, right. What's crazy Shit, to me, man. too, is that, uh, I mean, COVID might have had a, a hand in this, but uh, how these great records can be, can be composed from people in four corners of this country. Big time. Yeah, that's that blows my mind. We would that's sit. like what you have to do now. Yeah, right, right. Well, you guys I, are doing it the real way with by practicing as a fucking band three <laughs> times a week. That's unheard of today, right? I don't, I don't great. know any other way. Honestly, I I couldn't. I had such a hard time doing this. I'm a digital illiterate. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine trying to record a record with a guy in Texas and a guy in New York and a guy in sure. Florida, I couldn't do it. I, I We it's, did it, like you said, we would sit in a basement and rehearse them, practice them, and then when we were ready, we would rent a studio and go in there and, and hit it. But it, but that shows in the quality of the, the performances. I mean, you telling me that's a live recording is insane. Yeah, I never knew that. Um, <sighs> let's talk about the show. Yeah. Boy. October 7th gonna be a good one let me pull up the how are you feeling about it? it i feel good i feel yeah. good uh, i'm excited about it man a lot of good friends a lot of old friends uh a lot of good bands let's get the same place that tied downs at yeah uh, ramona from black iris uh jimmy from edgeman and curtis from uh crowfoot all the same people it's it's gonna be a good one was the lineup kind of a collaborative effort between you four yeah Yep. I, I ended up reaching out to most of these guys, but, and then I put it in their laps, but most of these guys that are on the, on the bill are all pals of mine. So I, I would call them yeah. up and say, Hey man, we're going to do a reunion show. You want in, come do it, please. And they, and they would, and they said, yeah. And then these promoter guys would, would take care of it. I imagine that's something that any band would drop everything to, to be on for sure. Uh, gonna, Blue gonna Collar Stoppers, Poison Tongues, D Block from Detroit, MH Chaos, New World Man, one of my favorite <sighs> current bands, Death Before Dishonor, Shattered Realm, Hate Inc., Death Threat, Integrity, Terror, Coldest Life. That's God a damn. crazy Ma- show. And Ma- I think Never Ending Game. Oh, and Ma- gotta, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, ne- never Ending Game, Mad Ball. This is an yeah. outdated list I'm even looking at. Yeah, That's they're crossed off. Gig. Yep. Never Ending Game yeah. and Mad Ball, too. Holy it's going to be a good one. And to, and, and tickets are flying. So if you're listening to this, A, buy them. But B, I'm going to give away two right now. Nice. And here's how here's how I'm going to do it. You're going to send, you're going to, you're going to, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or something, I want you to send Hard Lore a picture of your goatee. <laughs> and I'm going to send the top 10 to Jeff. <laughs> and Jeff is going to pick the best goatee. And if you have the best one, you win two tickets to the show. Nice. And, and if you're we're unable, we're back to if the you're community. unable, it, uh, how do we make it? You know, two tickets. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah. yeah no, right. if, yeah, you, you know, right. if you're unable to grow a goatee, yeah. you draw one on dope as hell. Make and it look if good. it wins, it wins. You know, if you yeah. look good, you'll look good. Period. <laughs> okay. I like it. 
But okay. Jeff is as the the uh, the grand master of the goatee community is going to be the one that decides. Hey, you want to hear a funny story, bro? Yes. Oh, so <laughs> we, we were in Europe again, and uh, we, we were with Theo and the noise, and he had this young kid named Jamie that was helping him with merch and driving. And uh, he was going sick in the pit, right? We're playing. And fucking uh, these meatheads were beating on him, just being being bogue, right? Beating on him, throwing yeah. him around. So I jumped off the stage and I smashed. I didn't smash him, but I, but I, you know, tuned him up a little bit to just to help this young kid out. I jumped back on stage and we finished. And uh, somebody was on the computer the next day, right? And they said, uh, two pigs and a goat," because two by two <laughs> by two guitar players were big. <laughs> they had big ass goatees. They, they started calling cold as light farmers. There's two pigs and a goat. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, man. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh. Have you have you the any any image I've seen of you ever, you have not you've had a gorgeous shiny bald head. How long have you has that been your 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 hairstyle? Oh, uh as soon as I started having daughters, I started losing hair, man. So, okay. Thank God. Thank God. I got a pretty head because I've had you to do, wear man. bald. That's a good bald head. Yeah. But let me ask you this, and this may be this may be a direction, a correlation to something evil going on in Detroit. Have you noticed the correlation between Detroit hardcore showgoers and hair loss? Uh, no, no. Brother, no. these fuckers are bald. Never in a game. They're bald. Gridiron. They're bald. Wow. S true love bald wow something's going on there. Hey, listen man most people that are like bald like this it's because they can't grow fucking hair if mm. i could grow hair i'd grow a little hair i don't know if i know i know but I i'm saying grow luxurious locks like yours but I would, grow, I would grow some hair i know you wouldn't that's why i'm saying something's going on in detroit in the water <laughs> or the air well, something's happening to make these 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 th there's injustice happening in Detroit to the community, turning them bald. And we got to get to the bottom of it. All right. Let's get at it. There's something going on to the to the goatee community, to the bald community <laughs> of Michigan. Jeff and Hardlore are are on it. We're on the case. On the We're going to figure this out. All right. All right. We're on anyway. it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we can't wait for the show. We're going to be there. Um, we have this grand idea to go around Detroit with you to kind of learn the, the show people the history of Detroit hardcore and mm. how special and important it is. Um, so we can't wait for that. Jeff, this has been, uh, this has one, been one of my favorite episodes of all time. Yeah, easy. I, I appreciate the invite, Bo. Colin, of course. I do. I Absolutely. Of course, man. Can't wait to see you in October. Are there any uh, final thoughts you would like to leave the listeners with decisions matter you know they all have <sighs> outcomes good or bad so what we do what we say how we think it all matters man we all impact people i think that the things that you care about the communities you live and the people you love you should invest in them you know everybody wants to play hard guy you know it's all fun and game everybody wants to be a beast until it's time to be a beast that's not what's important what's important is to to build impact people in a positive way uplift your brother uplift your city invest in your community the place you live the place you work people you care about you know what i mean that's what i would like to leave with people dude <laughs> greatest closing thoughts in the history of the show wow thank you jeff thank you for all for listening coldest life is back october 7th born to land hard repress is out now on a389 mm -hmm. declination of independence repress is out soon mm -hmm. Keep an eye out. We will see you October 7th. Sounds Thank good. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Bo.